Hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, part one of humanitarian applications using NASA Earth observations. Um, uh, this is a the first uh, RSET training on humanitarian applications. It's at an introductory level, so I uh, really appreciate you all tuning in today. Um, we are uh, uh, presenting this on June 14th, um, but we have a series of trainings, four parts, and these are all scheduled around um, World Refugee Day, which is on June 20th, 2022, uh, this year. And this timing um, is, is planned, it's intentional, because the topics we're talking about, one way or the other, really connect into um, the humanitarian concerns of refugee, which is to say forcibly displaced populations who have been forcibly displaced due to armed conflict. Um, and so we have four parts that sort of start, in a sense, chronologically at the beginning of this humanity, perhaps not at the beginning, but at a, at a key juncture in the humanitarian crisis. Um, that's today, we're start talking about monitoring urban damage, and we're gonna be doing that with, with INSAR, which uh, we'll be introducing um, in this presentation. Um, Thursday of this week, uh, we'll be talking about part two, which is looking at refugee settlement growth and population change. Uh, part three, next week, June uh, 21st, there we're talking about more land cover and land use uh, trends in and surrounding refugee settlements. And then part four, we're looking at um, the climatic conditions, climatic hazards at refugee camps. And that's next week, Thursday, June 23rd. So each of these parts is about two hours long. And um, just like this one, we'll have a question and answer session uh, at the conclusion of this presentation. <clears throat> Um, so we're kicking off here with part one of monitoring urban damage with INSAR. So you may be asking yourself, or maybe you've already answered it if you're here uh, joining the, the presentation, but why do we need a training on remote sensing applications in humanitarian settings? What is special about humanitarian settings? Uh, that's a good question. Um, any remote sensing approach um, that is useful for mapping environmental condition or change. And there we're talking about land cover classification, say building detection, hazard assessments. All of those could be effective, could be relevant in a humanitarian setting. Really, they, sh they should be, right? There's no reason why the environmental condition or change would be somehow undetectable, um, inherently undetectable just because it's a humanitarian setting. It's not that different from a sort of traditional let's say policy evaluation or SDG assessments, other things that, um, that our set trainings have been developed for. Um, we know that the same kind of conditions in a refugee camp are may, may mirror the same kind of conditions that we see in a megacity um, in terms of the vegetation condition, in terms of you know, the spectral conditions of the built-up materials. So all these data that we're collecting, there's nothing um, inherently different about how we're going to what we're going to extract from these data. We aren't introducing some humanitarian specific algorithms or anything to this nature. So all of these data that NASA are collecting with the Earth, Earth Observation Fleet that we see in the video on the right-hand side, these, uh, these all could tell us something about humanitarian setting as any other place. But the difference, the reason that we have this, um, this training in particular um, is because we need to know about the context. We need to know about the specific concerns in humanitarian settings. We need to understand really what's not so much different about the data that we're getting from satellites, but what's unique about the, the context, what's unique about the settlements, what's unique about, for example, the migration uh, or population dynamics um, at uh, within humanitarian settings. Humanitarian contexts, of course, are about people. Um, and as we all know, um, satellite remote sensing are not really designed to detect people, right? They're not designed to detect um, concerns and perceptions of environmental change. They tell us about changes uh, in the environment, on the land, on water, in uh, polar regions, um, ice and snow, and in the atmosphere, and all the interactions they're in. So we're kind of pushing these in this direction towards more of the, the humanitarian setting and it, really thinking about community humanitarian concerns around armed conflict. Um, and thinking about how and being aware of how we need to process and interpret these satellite data in these specific contexts. So we have to know something about um, the, the humanitarian setting to, to best use these data. So that's where this presentation is coming from. We're building on a lot of the other RSET trainings uh, that introduce the different analytical tools and techniques and data sets. 
but we're putting them in this context and really um, framing them around this kind of application. Um, this is um, really valuable for humanitarian settings because usually we're operating in a pretty data scarce environment. And so the, the um, inherent capability of satellite remote sensing data to observe changes over broad scales, broad timelines, and of course that specific time uh, dates and specific um, locations, super, super valuable because often humanitarian settings, uh, they're, uh, it's very dangerous to visit um, active conflict zones, so we can't necessarily be there to assess things. And in some cases, we're dealing with a highly dynamic situations where we can't have people on the ground and ready to respond to a uh, concern. Um, and sometimes the, the scenario is that we have very remote, uh, geographically remote or, or um, difficult to reach for some other reason uh, settings. And so these are all classic applications where remote sensing is, is really, really valuable. Um, so we're going to be working through some of these different applications, um, different contexts over the four parts of this training. Um, after um, the uh, training it's done in whole on um, these four different parts. Um, we hope that that those of you who are joining um, will be able to understand uh, and, and really take action on using landscape and settlement level monitoring in some of the different contexts that we're talking about, which is far from being exhaustive, but but I think does a, a great sense of getting a sample. Um, thinking about some of the benefits, limitations of different kinds of satellite imagery, we'll be we'll be working with a bunch of different kinds uh, throughout these four trainings. Thinking about the value of using time series analysis, so not just before, after, or a snapshot of imagery, but but rather um, repeat long-term data acquisition so that we can detect what's happening surely over the long term, but also at specific dates, because we have images that sort of bookend came right before and came right after a thing we know happened. We'll be doing that in today's training. Um, and uh, what about bringing in other kinds of data? Uh, lots of other data sets are relevant. Open access, geospatial products on population, building footprints, infrastructure. We'll be working with these uh, in, the, in the next couple of trainings in particular, uh, or parts in particular. Um, and being cognizant of the limitations. What data are appropriate or useful for an application? There's no one size fits all uh, use case, right? Um, there are always limitations and we'll, we'll do our best to have a critical view on where we can rely on satellite data to give us a, a useful and insightful take on the conditions and where we're saying, ah, actually, we're kind of at the edge of what we can do uh, with satellite in this case. And I should say that while this introductory training is um, all four parts of it are really focused on um, armed conflict refugee settings, that's only one side, uh, one kind of corner of, the, of humanitarian concern. There's um, environmental displacement. There are all other kinds of scenarios that could come in to cause humanitarian settings. And we're not just, um, we aren't going to be addressing it, any of those outside of the sort of conflict scenario. Um, but suffice it to say that um, a lot of what we're presenting in these trainings, uh, in these four parts of this training, should be relevant um, for other kinds of applications such as a natural hazard or environmental displacement um, scenario. Um, so today, monitoring urban damage with INSAR, this is coming out of the recognition that um, widespread repeat damage within cities, within urban settings is a hallmark of modern and, um, and increasingly urbanized warfare. Uh, many of you can probably name off the top of your head some, some key conflict sites um, around the world. Ukraine is obviously in the news right now, um, but there's many others. And unfortunately, this is, a, uh, this is a, a persistent problem, a challenge that we have not really been able to address in a consistent way. Um, so we, we, we have seen many of these large-scale armed conflicts um, erupt over the last couple of years. We'll be doing a specific case study today on, on Aleppo, Syria. Um, we know that monitoring urban damage isn't just about detecting land cover change, it's about protecting civilians who are living in these cities. It's about looking at implications for migration, for food security, for uh, even post-conflict uh, restructure, uh, rebuilding, um, following structural and infrastructural damage over the course of the conflict. Um, it's also, we're also motivated by the fact that multi-temporal satellite remote sensing data like we'll be working with today and in the other um, parts of this uh, humanitarian applications training, 
still are kind of coming into their own um, in terms of having a humanitarian application and in particular in mapping um, urban damage. And the way we're, we'll be presenting it today is, is a one way of mapping urban damage um, and perhaps one that has been used less than others. Um, so goals, we're gonna be detecting locations of urban change during armed conflict using a specific case study. We'll be doing that using INSAR time series data over um, a, a different stages um, throughout the conflict. And we'll be thinking about some of um, the strengths and limitations of radar data, uh, both in terms of the sort of sensitivity to change, but also the kind of classic spatial detail um, uh, challenges compared to some of the more traditional data sources like optical or nighttime lights data. Um, my name is Jamin Vandenhoek. I'm an associate professor of geography at Oregon State University. I've been talking so far in this presentation. Um, I'm about to hand it over to Corey Scher, who is a PhD student at City University of New York. Um, thanks so much for, for joining today. Um, we have a couple of suggestions um, before we get into to the case study, uh, as well as the background that Corey will walk us through. Um, the fundamentals of remote sensing, um, RSET training, introduction to synthetic aperture radar, and SAR for disasters and hydrological applications would all be great uh, uh, sort of precedents for this. We'll be building especially on um, some of the uh, fundamentals of remote sensing and introduction to synthetic aperture radar training. So please check these out. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Corey. So after reviewing some of the recommended RSET trainings that Jamin uh, pointed to in the last slide, I, I want to introduce just a, a first level background, maybe that will help to uh, facilitate your review of further material, but we want to introduce synthetic aperture radar and how we can use this specific type of satellite data to map indicators of urban damage uh, that arise in our case during a conflict. So, First, I have two images of the same place, New York City, that's where, I'm, where I am right now. Uh, the island of Manhattan is in the center. And these are two images, satellite images, from two types of different satellite sensors that show us complementary views of a complicated world. So in the left panel is the Sentinel-2 true color optical image, uh, 10 meter spatial resolution, acquired over the city on April 12th, 2022. And on the right is, is a Sentinel-1 SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar, Backscatter Intensity Image. And the VV is specific to a polarization. Um, this image was acquired on May 10th, 2022. And I'm gonna walk through what the different things that we can see from a radar or a SAR image relative to an optical image and build a conceptual understanding of the difference between optical and radar and how we can use radar to map things like urban damage. So first about the optical image. The colors in the image tell us about the spectral characteristics of an image region. And those spectral characteristics tell us about the chemistry or the, the color of a pixel. In the first arrow, I'm pointing to a reservoir in Central Park. Um, that you can see in the, the panel on the right. And, and the second arrow, I'm just pointing to Midtown Manhattan Times Square. So these areas, the color in, that we can see with our eye in these images reflect what you would see on the ground if you were, if you were to visit those areas, albeit at a much coarser spatial resolution. But a radar image can tell us more about the structure of a region because synthetic aperture radar is a technique that illuminates a region with microwaves and records the echo. It records the reflection of those microwave pulses that travel back to the sensor. The way I like to think about this and the way I introduce it commonly to students uh, or friends and family is like a camera flash. A camera flash sends light to a surface like my face and the light bounces off back to the camera. So it can take a picture of me or I can take a picture of something else in the dark because we send a signal out that is reflected from a surface and comes back to the sensor. We call that active remote sensing. So SAR is a, a, a type of active remote sensing. And the image on the right 
is showing us the intensity of the returned microwave echo to the sensor. This is, in a sense, the strength of the returned echo. And I'll get into more of that in a second. But we refer to this image as a, a backscatter intensity image. And it tells us how strong the returns are to the sensor. Synthetic aperture radar looks at objects differently than an optical sensor. So the sensor, the SAR sensor, is actually sending a signal in what we call slant range. So from an angle, it illuminates the, the target region and, and the radar echoes reflect back to the satellite in most cases. Whereas an optical sensor passively receives reflected sunlight almost always directly above a target. And, and we refer to that as, as native, directly above a target. And you can see the difference in, in the schematic below uh, the SAR sensor sending a signal from, from the side versus an optical sensor looking at the same structure from above. What SAR can tell us is about the structure of an imaging region because different types of surfaces will affect how radar signals scatter and it will in turn affect how those areas appear in an image. So from left to right in the schematic below, which is from the SAR handbook, from the NASA SERVIR project, which I'm linked to and is also in the citations. There's a rough surface where scattering is diffuse. Think of something like bare soil. I'll get more into roughness in a bit. There can be different types of scattering in a forest. You'll notice the green scattering is uh, called labeled volume, and that scatters throughout the trees and branches of a, of a tree, uh, sorry, the leaves and branches of a tree. And then you have this thing called double bounce, where you'll have radar hit one surface, like a road, and then reflect off the side of another surface, like a building. And that can happen both in forests, as you can see in the middle panel, and also in cities. And those double bounce backscatter mechanisms are some of the result in some of the highest intensity radar signal retrievals. So the roughness of a sur surface is therefore really important. A smooth surface like calm water will scatter signals away from the satellite, while a rougher surface will, will scatter, scatter signals uh, back toward the satellite. And we define roughness relative to the outgoing signal wavelength from the SAR sensor. And that's denoted by lambda in the figure below. So we can directly relate the wavelength to the roughness of a surface and get an idea of the type of scattering we could expect based on surface types. So from left to right, we would get very little return from a smooth surface where the height variation across an image region is less than 1 32nd of the outgoing signal wavelength. And in the middle panel, we can expect moderate returns to a sensor if the roughness of an image region is between 1 32nd and 1 half of the outgoing signal wavelengths. And on the right, we can expect the strongest returns from surfaces that are greater than half the signal wavelength, which we would define as rough. The satellite sends out a signal with a fixed frequency. So we always know the signal that leaves the satellite. And the returned echoes are directly related to this outgoing signal. The sensor we're going to work with today is the Sentinel-1 sensor. It's, to date, the only open access synthetic aperture radar time series Earth observation. And that has a uh, signal wavelength of about five and a half centimeters. So if you have an image region, and you can imagine your image region is 10 meters um, projected onto the ground, and you have variable building sizes within a city, say there's some structures next to a road, that means the difference in height between those two buildings is much greater than the signal wavelength. We would call that a rough surface. Similarly, if you till an agricultural soil and the, the, the height difference between a trough and uh, a mound is on the order or greater than half the signal wavelength, it would similarly be rough for this sensor, which is C-band, we call in radar. One other characteristic of the SAR wavelength is that 
the, the longer outgoing wavelength, the further the signal can penetrate into something like a forest canopy. As the signal wavelength increases, the penet penetration depth increases. So again, a figure from the SAR handbook below, on the left-hand side, we have radar signals, uh, um, a cartoon of X-band radar signals, which are three centimeters, smaller than what we're working with today, which are essentially scattered by the top of a vegetative canopy, like a forest. And as you move through C-band, the scattering makes it deeper within the vegetative canopy, but it doesn't quite get to the ground. You don't get that double bounce backscatter that I've mentioned before. But as you get into L band and P band, these wavelengths are long enough to make it through the canopy of a forest and actually scatter off of the ground um, and the tree trunks, which you wouldn't have with a shorter wavelength. So the scattering, the, the outgoing signal wavelength affects the scattering mechanisms, the scattering characteristics of the surface. Urban areas are strong reflectors of radar signals. Well, water surfaces are not. So I've tried to illustrate this, and we've just talked about how trees can scatter signals throughout the volume of their forest. Buildings in urban areas act as these corner reflectors of radar signals, which send back radar echoes with some of the highest intensity. Soils scatter signals at the surface, generally with lower intensity, and calm water will scatter signals generally away from the sensor. There's one other thing imaging radar is sensitive to for, for our purposes today, which is changes in moisture content, like snow melt uh, or rain on soil. And this will also really affect radar scattering. So in the example below, I'm showing images from a, a paper I authored last year on snow melt uh, over glaciers in high mountain Asia. And in panel A, I'm showing an average SAR backscatter intensity image during a snowmelt period. Note that the region is dark, dark relative to in panel B, which is the average scattering during a frozen period, so when all of the snow is dry. Panel C is an, an, is an example of this region. It's a glaciated region in the Himalayas. And D is the difference between backscattering in image A and B. And you can see a pronounced difference, so between 2 and 10 decibels across the region between the seasonal, the snow melt season and the frozen season backscatter. So moisture content, and we call this the surface dielectric, changes in the surface dielectric can also really affect scattering characteristics. Another important thing to note about SAR is that the side-looking nature of the sensor causes geometric distortions. And these distortions affect the ground sampling frequency of ultimately the images that we'll retrieve. Along the slant range, which is the line of sight of the satellite, we'll get geometric distortions like foreshortening, uh, layover, and radar shadows beneath mountains or structures that we ultimately need to correct for. So an image that is projected in the slant range um, is, in our case, called a single look complex image. And I'll get into that later as we work through the example. And then an image projected in the ground range has been corrected for the terrain and for the viewing geometry of the sensor. So how should we look at this image over New York City? First of all, the geometry of the region looks familiar. This is, this is a ground range detected image over New York City. So we have corrected for the viewing geometry of the SAR sensor and for some of the topography in the region. Now that we know we're looking at a ground range detected image, we can look at this water on the Hudson River or back at the Central Park Reservoir and understand why it appears dark. The water appears dark because the SAR signal is being scattered away. Also on the Hudson River, I want to highlight these little bright dots on the river 
are actually ships, container ships traveling up the Hudson River. And you, we are getting actually double bounds off the water surface and off the hull of the ship, which may get back to the sensor with high intensity. So we can actually see, these are not bad pixels. These are, these are likely ships traveling up or down the Hudson River. And then generally Manhattan and the areas around it are, are bright because built up areas in those regions are sending high intensity returns, likely from double bounce scattering back towards the sensor. So we, we see them. And in this lower image, which is um, near Wall Street, this lower portion of the image, there is an intensity so bright it, it, it makes this star shape. That's, that's a very high intensity return. So radar satellites, due to their sensitivity to the structure of a region, are commonly used to map damage proxies, indicators of damage to urban or otherwise built up infrastructure after natural hazards. So the image below is from the NASA Advanced Rapid Imaging Assessment Group, uh, which commonly puts out things called damage proxy maps after a natural hazard, a natural disaster. The red areas in, in this image illustrate proxies for urban damage from radar satellite derived data. Um, these data were generated from a sensor we won't be working with today, but indicate the same, we indicate the same type of change we would we will be working with in our example. So how can radar satellites be used to map this type of damage? And it, it has to do with SARS sensitivity to the arrangement of structures in an imaging region. So in the, in the panel on the right, there are two columns, one with an intact and one with a destroyed, you know, cartoon of a structure. The partial collapse of a building will change the orientation of a, the scattering, the scatterer within a region. We, we call things scatterers in an image region, um, but in this case, this is a building. Um, when the building is destroyed, its orientation um, is different than when it was intact. But if we were if we were to look at this from above, uh, imagining that the roof itself was not destroyed, and we were trying to use an optical image, an optical imaging sensor to map this damage, we wouldn't really see much change. But with synthetic aperture radar, it's possible it's possible to detect this type of change using information in the phase denoted by lambda in this last row where you can see more path lengths, more wave cycles, if you will, uh, after the building was destroyed compared to when it was intact. So phase measures the quote, range and complexity of an image region. And this is a slide that you'll see in the prior RSET trainings on introduction to INSAR and SAR applications in monitoring hazards, natural disasters. Uh, and it comes out of Paul Rosen's 2008 training in principles and theory of radar interferometry from UNAVCO. But this, the, sensor, the sensor sends out a fixed signal that undergoes a fixed number of, of a number of wave cycles. So that the first component of a SAR signal is the number of wave cycles completed or traveled before the signal is returned to the sensor. So we, we call this a measure of the range of the signal, essentially how far the signal went before it reached an image region. But in addition to range, SAR phase measures the randomness of path lengths in an image region. So you can see these little path lengths that are drawn here. They all have slightly different lengths and they're, they're going to different types of surfaces within the region. And that'll re cause randomness in the region, which makes phase, SAR phase, a complex signal. But we can sort out the complexity of an image region by differencing two SAR phases, in, in our case acquired at different times, and accounting for the range component and getting just an idea of the complexity within that region. 
interferometry or INSAR, interferometric synthetic aperture radar, measures the difference in two complex phases with SAR acquisitions at different times. We use it to map topography at the Earth's surface or changes in the structure of the Earth's surface, like ground motion after an earthquake, or in this example panel, ground motion due to subsidence of a home. So you can see a satellite at a similar position, acquiring images at one time, T naught, T zero, and another time at T naught plus delta T, so some time later. And what happened is between these two acquisitions is the position of the house effectively sank. So we had this change in the height, change in the range of the SARF signal that we can measure through interferometry. So we can measure the phase shift between two acquisitions by essentially differencing two SAR phase measurements acquired from the same position at different times. But INSAR can also be sensitive to construction of buildings like this stadium from Wright et al. 2006. And it can be used in things like intelligence applications where the INSAR data can map things like vehicle tracks through fields because of the difference in texture that results after a large vehicle with comp compact soils and change the arrangement of the scatterers, in this case soils, in that image region. And for us today, INSAR can be used to map building damage and destruction, um, in this case due to conflict. Um, in the panel, uh, the figure is a damage proxy map over Mosul, Iraq from the time period uh, 2014 to 2017 by Bolduran, uh, published last year. And the red areas are, are proxies for urban damage. So all of these examples use INSAR coherence to detect change. And coherence is an estimate of the scattering stability of an, of an image region. And what coherence estimates is the correlation between two phases. But because SAR has a range component and a random component, coherence is therefore an estimate of the complex correlation between two phase signals. And we use it intuitively, uh, you can think of it, to understand the randomness of an image region. Are scatterers in an image region randomly reorganizing and, and not associated to the, the last image pass from the sensor? Or are they stable? And are they giving you similar phase information that you saw in prior acquisitions? So coherence is measured from zero, incoherent, completely random image regions to one, perfectly coherent, stable structures. And what I did in the panels below is make a coherence image using two Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar images captured within 12 days of each other last month over the same region I've been highlighting, New York City. Um, you can see kind of intuitively in, in the panels May 10th and May 22nd that these images more or less look very similar. So when I interfere them, when we, when we do INSAR and retrieve a coherence image over this region, which is in the right panel, uh, areas that are very light in color are coherence values close to one. That is to say that there wasn't much structural reorganization across New York City within this 12-day period. And most of those regions are what we refer to as coherent clusters or regions of persistent scatterers. An important thing to note about coherence itself is that it is equally sensitive to different types of changes. So we often denote coherence with a gamma, and it's made up of these various components. And the co components of coherence multiply so that any source of decorrelation can result in low coherence. I want to I want to make an aside and say that coherence and correlation 
are two terms often used interchangeably. But knowledge of the local characteristics of an imaging region is necessary to properly conceptualize and interpret INSAR coherence. For example, as time increases between two image acquisitions, so gamma sub t is the temporal change in coherence, the correlation will generally decrease with increasing time. So there's a lot of literature on accounting for this gradual decrease in coherence over time. And I'll point again to the RSET introduction to interferometric SAR um, by Eric Fielding for um, this equation, but also for a more in-depth overview of INSAR. But for our sake today, mapping proxies for damage from military conflict, we want sudden changes, denoted in Dr. Fielding's presentation as gamma sub c. And to retrieve signals of sudden damage, it means we need to minimize other types of decorrelation that are related to processes not likely associated with the signals we want to retrieve. So we have some straightforward ways of mitigating other types of decorrelation, so anything that's not a sudden change, that we'll employ today. And that includes masking out areas of low coherence in pre-event scenes. So if, if the area is already somehow random, we don't necessarily want to look for a change in that region because there likely isn't a stable scatterer in the region. We also can minimize the difference in gradual changes, gamma sub t, by choosing INSAR pairs with similar temporal baseline. In, in the case of today, we'll do the minimum temporal baseline of 12 days between Sentinel-1 acquisitions. And we also need to minimize geometric causes of discorrelation, which have to do with the difference in vantage point of the SAR acquisitions. So these geometric distortions can affect our coherence. And what's going to be important today is understanding something called perpendicular baseline, which is a B with a perpendicular sign. And this is a component of the difference in vantage points from which our images used as an INSAR pair are acquired. So for INSAR damage mapping and for a lot of other INSAR applications, we want the perpendicular baseline to be small. And you can see in the schematic below, which is from the ASF Sentinel-1 INSAR product guide, the baseline is decomposed into a parallel and perpendicular component. And I would strongly suggest that you review the Sentinel-1 INSAR product guide from the Alaska Satellite Facility for a more in-depth understanding of the products that we're going to process and retrieve from their service today. In monitoring proxies for, dam for damage um, due to urban conflict, we want to find highly coherent areas that decorrelate suddenly with conflict. So that means we want to look for coherent image regions that show reduced coherence during a conflict event. So we expect the main assumption is that the coherence will decrease after a conflict event in an image region. So in mapping proxies for conflict damage, we assume that this damage would cause deviations in the scattering profile of features in a city, and that this would uh, disrupt the temporal stability of a region. So in order to capture this type of change, we're eventually uh, effectively going to need a before and an after comparison. But generating a before and after comparison is a little more complicated than simply differencing two images in this case, because first we need to make INSAR coherence images. So to capture a decrease in coherence, we're gonna to need to assemble one reference and one event coherence image. The reference coherence image will be from before the conflict period of study, and the event coherence image will be during, it will span uh, some period of conflict. So this will require three SAR images to make two coherence 
images from two INSAR pairs. So one pair will be from what we'll call a pre-event period, for example, time one and time two. And the other pair will be for the event period between T2 and T3. So the event is our conflict, and that's where we want to detect change. So we select a pre-conflict image based on the conflict chronology. And we want to use a reference to scene from before the conflict period of study, which in this case will be an image acquired at T2. It can serve as a common reference for the pre-event in blue and the event in SAR coherence images that we generate from images acquired at T1 and T3. Something to note here is that coherence doesn't have a directional component. So if you interfered images acquired at T1 and T2 with time one as a reference image or time two as a reference image, you would get basically the same coherence value. There is no directional component. But what does matter is the time between acquisitions, like I mentioned before. For our example today, we're going to look at 12 days in Aleppo, Syria in late April of 2016. So our pre-event period will be April 5th to the 17th, and the event period will be April 17th to the 29th. This way, our comparison has a, a common reference image on April 17th, 2016. And I'll note as an aside that you, Damage mapping over Aleppo for this training is simply to illustrate the approach, um, as unfortunately there are many case studies where we could have looked. Um, but we're just using this case as, as an illustration of the technique. So now we're going to go over a little background on Aleppo. Um, that Jamin will walk us through. And then I'm going to continue with a live run through of tasking the ASF server to process insert images. Thanks, Corey. Um, right, as Corey said, we are not undertaking a wall-to-wall, a, a -wall, so to speak, a citywide damage assessment, certainly not a nationwide damage assessment, looking over um, over Aleppo or over, over the country of Syria. We're also not going to be looking uh, over the duration of this war, which started in uh, 2011 and continues to this day. We're selecting specific known conflict events when and locations, right, where we have uh, direct means of, uh, for our purposes in this training, of validating, of, of cross-referencing uh, the kinds of um, decoherence that we're seeing in the INSAR uh, damage proxy mapping approach. So we've chosen Aleppo um, because there are many, many cases to choose from, unfortunately. So some estimates put, uh, we can see it in this video here, um, just sort of a drone view flying over the city, but you can see widespread damage in these images. Um, it's damage to uh, the roadways, it's damage to buildings. We see there is a, a good example of partially collapsed buildings. We sometimes have totally destroyed buildings. Uh, we have piles of rubble that appear in the street um, and may be cleaned up uh, soon after or may not be. Those also contribute to uh, decoherence. Um, there's a variety, of course, vegetation changes inherently contribute to decoherence. So there's a, there's a whole range a phenomena um, within just the city of Aleppo that are causing these, and this kind of um, uh, these kind of dynamics within the city are critical to understand because the city is still populated. Right, um, there are people living within Aleppo. Um, the estimate uh, during throughout the entirety of the war, um, the estimated population of Aleppo right before the the war started was around three million. Um, and three years into the war, it dropped down to approximately 600,000. So we have a 80% uh, decline in population um, in three years. It's massive. And Aleppo is just one of the, the large cities within Syria that had sort of similar dynamics. 
um, during the war. These images that we, this image just on the still of the video, um, we see uh, damage to most of the structures that we can see there. Um, some estimates put, uh, it's difficult to say, right, exact numbers, but some estimates put just in Aleppo, 36,000 buildings were damaged or destroyed um, by 2016. So five years into this war, which is now, that estimate's five years old, um, we, we saw 36,000 uh, buildings, not, not specific events, but 36,000 building structures that were damaged or destroyed during this period. So it is um, widespread, large scale, recurrent and persistent damage that we're seeing. Um, and for the purposes of our training, again, we, we basically have a lot of examples to choose from and Aleppo itself um, offers uh it's a it's a uh it's a, a densely uh built up city so we have large structures that are being damaged which again is just it's a better case study just for the training today um so i'll hand it back to corey um but uh we're we're at this stage in the in the training where we corey gave an excellent overview of some of the theory and conceptualization of how we're applying INSAR, and we're just transitioning now into the specific uh, case study analysis, and we'll be going through step by step a couple of uh, our interpretations of what we're seeing from INSAR uh, damage detection within Aleppo at this specific window uh, that we've identified as being um, a known period with uh, acute damage to, to certain uh, areas of the city. So back to Corey. Thanks, Jamin. Um, and before we get into interpretation, we got to first make our INSAR images and do our change detection. So here's an outline of our approach uh, for the tutorial today. If, if you haven't already, we're, we're going to register for SAR processing resources at the Alaska Satellite Facility through their Vertex tool. We're going to search for our reference image over Aleppo. And then we'll use the baseline tool on ASF Vertex to select two INSAR pairs that I uh, mentioned earlier, and we'll submit those tasks for processing the interferograms. I'll walk through the, the one parameter that we'll have to specify for the processing, and we'll let that processing occur and download the process data. And then I'll walk through the actual change detection techniques where we um, calculate the percent change in coherence uh, relative to the pre event period and we mask out areas of low coherence using the pre-event image, and then we'll visualize and interpret the results against some high-resolution optical imagery that's freely available um, in Google Earth Pro. So the logins and platforms that, that'll be needed for this tutorial are a, a user account at the ASF, Alaska Satellite Facility uh, Vertex tool, and an analytical geographic information system environment. So QGIS, Python, R, whatever you prefer, uh, ArcGIS. Um, so what I'm gonna do is walk through the no code example where I'll show you how to use the graphical interface at ASF Vertex to generate these entire images. Look, I've, we've also published a code example using the Python API for the Vertex tool. Um, and that's linked in this training, and you can refer to that if you're more comfortable using Python um, as opposed to a user interface. Okay, so we're going to navigate to the ASF Vertex tool. Um, so here we are, and it gives us a base map of centered on the US um, and some search options. So before we start searching, I'm gonna sign in. And if you haven't already, now is the time to uh, register for an ASF Vertex account because they give us some very powerful open Earth observation processing tools to work with and which have drastically reduced the barrier to entry to this kind of analysis. Um, so I have to sign in now. And now I am signed in as Corey Sure, that's me. And what we're gonna do is search for uh, images over Aleppo in April of 2017, uh, 2016, April 17, 2016. So first I'm gonna go over to Aleppo, zoom in. 
and draw our area of interest. So I can click once to draw a polygon and click again to finish it. So that is our area of interest for now. You can see that the vertex will generate well-known text above, which you can use to turn into a geometry elsewhere so you can keep track of your search region. But next we wanna filter first by the date. And we can choose this pop-up to select the year 2016, the month of April. And since we know our image, we know what we're looking for already, which is April 17th, I'm just gonna limit this to April 15th and then to April, I'm sorry, April 18th. So from here, we need to select our file type. And recall that phase is a complex single signal. So we need to select level one, L1, single look complex imagery. Those are gonna have the phase information that we need in order to do INSAR analysis. So we'll select that. And then I'm gonna say, update the search. So we should see one image, and that is the image we're going to use. You can zoom out and uh, get a sense of the geographic coverage of this scene. Um, and just to make sure that this is what we want, we can double check the date here, which is April 17th, 2016, uh, acquired over about 30 seconds. And it's on the ascending orbit track. So now that we've found our image, what we're gonna do is use the baseline tool, which you can see here in the bottom. The baseline tool uses the April 17th image as a reference image for INSAR analyses from all of the images in the Sentinel-1 collection that overlap this region along the same orbit path and along the same frame of acquisition. So you can see all of these different outlines are here. These can all be used to make INSAR pairs. And there's two things to note. Offset in the images. So we can click on this one and see that it's acquired in a different place than maybe that one slightly. That is, is our baseline offset, perpendicular baseline offset. The other type of offset we have is a temporal offset. So these columns where you have the image ID on the left, which you can copy if you need it, give us two values. First, there is 69 meters, um, which is the perpendicular baseline. And then there's minus 553 days, which is the temporal baseline. So the image on October 13th was acquired 553 days before the April 17th 2016 image was acquired. Because we know our criteria for baseline, we can filter by dates of interest. So we'll have to select 2016, April 5th, and then 2016, April 29th. And we can submit that search and we'll see three INSAR images. And on this plot, we have on the left y-axis perpendicular baseline in meters, and on the, on the x-axis temporal baseline in days. So our image acquired on April 5th, you can select and it'll highlight on the plot, was acquired 12 days before and with a 31 meter difference offset in the perpendicular baseline. Whereas the image on April 29th, 2016, was acquired 12 days later. So it has the same temporal baseline as the, as the other image from April 5th, but its perpendicular baseline was 10 meters. So the difference in these perpendicular baselines is only 21 meters, which for our purposes is considered quite small. So there is a third image here and it's, it, it's an image it's an INSAR pair relative to the reference image. So that's why there's zero meters and zero days. And 
for a sanity check or to account for other types of coherence, we might process this. Uh, but for today, we're just going to ignore that. So for each of these uh, INSAR pairs, other than the pair with the reference image itself, we want to choose INSAR gamma processing and then the option to add one SLC pair. So SLC, again, stands for single look complex. So we'll do that once right there, and you get a pop-up that says the job has been added to your queue for INSAR gamma processing. And then we'll do the same thing for our event image, image pair, excuse me. We'll add that to the processing queue. So once we've added those to our processing queue, we can open up the on-demand queue and see what we have there. So in the INSAR gamma processing, we have two images that we've just selected. Um, we can see the pairs here. The first image is 417, reference image, to April 29th, 429, 2016. And the second is April 5th to April 17th. Um, and in, in, before we submit this task, we have to look at our processing options. And the one option that we do need to change is the what we call in radar multi-looking. And this is a way of essentially <laughs> reducing what's called speckle in radar imagery. And for more details on multi-looking and, and the number of looks used in multi-looking, I'll refer to past RSET trainings that we've linked to and also the Sentinel-1 product guide for ASF itself that I, I linked to earlier in the presentation. But for our purposes today, there's two options here. One is looks in 20 by four, so 20 looks in range, and four looks in azimuth, so perpendicular to the range of the image. And that, if we chose that image, that uh, option, we would get data uh, output data that's 80 meters uh, spatial resolution. But if we choose 10 by 2 looks, we'll get a 40 meter output resolution product. And for our purposes, we want the uh, finer spatial detail that one would hope for in monitoring a city. Um, and so we'll choose 10 by 2 looks. And this will result in a 40 meter resolution product. So once we've done that, today we're not going to need any of these other components, so I'm going to skip over them and I'll simply say submit two jobs. We'll be prompted to give it a name. So I'm going to call it Aleppo RSET April 2016. And I'll submit those two jobs. I've gotten an alert that the two jobs were successfully submitted. And now I can view the submitted products and we're gonna see all sorts of other jobs I've submitted recently. But we can filter by our product name, which was Aleppo RSET April 2016, and we'll see our two images. Um, we can see that the status of the processing is pending. And when the processing has begun, the status will say running. And when the processing is complete, we're going to get um, we're going to get results that look like this. So this is processing that I've already done, and uh, of the same images. So you can see April fifth and April seventeenth. And for each of these, the completed processing, we just want to add to our cart for download. So I've added the two scenes to our cart. We're just assuming the processing was completed successfully. Um, this is what an INSAR phase image looks like, but I haven't talked about that much today. Um, so anyway, with these two images added to our cart, I can go over to our downloads and I'll remove this and and we'll see the two the two uh, successfully completed jobs here in our in our download queue, and we can simply download the files by clicking the download button. Uh, so we'll be prompted to save the uh, download somewhere. I'll do it in my downloads folder. 
And we'll do the same thing again for the others. So from there, with, with that happening, uh, once we download our images, we're going to unzip the folders that we have. I like to put them into a working directory where I can keep all my data organized. And then we're going to load the coherence files, which are denoted with a suffix called core dot tip. So we've downloaded our insar coherent our processed insar coherence data. We've unzipped the files. And now we're looking at the contents of the files for one ending in the suffix underscore cor dot tif. This stands for correlation, but these are our coherence images. Like I said, these terms are often used interchangeably. And what we're going to do at this point is very simple raster band math with the event and the pre event coherence data sets to calculate a change in coherence relative to the pre event data set so that we'll have a percent change in coherence. So delta gamma will be the change in coherence between the pre-event and event coherence images expressed as a percent. So the change in coherence is happening on a per pixel basis. Um, so if you're familiar with raster band calculations, differencing two rasters is a, is a chain, is a way of comparing two pixels in the same image region. So you can complete this part of the task in, in a geospatial information system environment, or you can do it in your favorite coding environment. But this is going to show us the difference in coherence on a per pixel basis across the region. So we'll resolve that difference data set. And then we have to deal with different types of masking that will help us to receive uh, signals only in regions that were stable and destabilized ostensibly during this conflict period. So the first step in doing that is to make a mask out of areas of low pre-event coherence. So these are regions that were not, uh, that did not have a high coherence value in our pre-event coherence image. And we can make a mask for those regions by using a fixed threshold um, on the pre-event coherence image. So in the panels to the right, there's an Esri base map from QGIS. Um, and further on the right is a pre-event coherence mask. So white areas are <clears throat> regions, image regions, with a pre-event coherence greater than 0 0.9. So we call this a pretty high coherence value. This is relatively conservative. But note how much of the region actually has a high coherence value um, in the pre-event image. This means that between April 5th and April 17th, there weren't too many structural or dielectric changes at the surface. So we can rely, hopefully, on these white areas for change detection uh, relative to the event period of the conflict that we're, that we're looking at later in April. The second thing we need to mask for are areas that increased in coherence. So we are not interested in areas that became more stable. Uh, relative to the pre-event period. Because the signal we're looking for is a decrease in coherence, a rearrangement of scatters that led to increased randomness. Whereas the opposite can be true if, um, uh, in other examples, you can, you can have an increased coherence if, if you turn a vegetated surface into a built-up surface, for example. That, that would cause an increase in coherence. Or if uh, the tilling of an agricultural field was completed and there was no change to the structure of the soils, there, there would be an increase in coherence. So we want to mask out areas where the change in coherence was greater than or equal to zero. Um, so now we have two masks that will apply to our change in coherence image and we'll get something that looks like this. The red areas are regions in our map with a decrease in coherence on a percentage basis of 15% relative to the pre-event coherence. So um, this is ultimately the damage proxy map that uh, we wanted to make. And you'll, you'll notice that there are a lot of light 
white areas. This is overlaid onto a Esri base map in QGIS. And we'll see dark red patches throughout the image. Um, and what we're going to do now is investigate some of those patches because these data can help guide our analysis of things like high resolution optical imagery. So if we look at this first area, which is a greater than 15% decrease in coherence during the event period, we can focus in on it and compare to some historical, uh, very high resolution optical imagery that's now freely available in um, Google Earth Pro. We'll, we'll just do this to illustrate the process of guiding image analysis using insert coherence change. So in this image, uh, historical imagery over that, that region I was pointing to, there was Maxar data acquired on April 16th, 2016, which was just the day before our pre-event period ended. And then another image was acquired and made freely available on June 11th which shows destruction visible in our image region. So it happened sometime after April 16th um, and by June 11th. But you can see that there were destroyed structures, there are burn scars, and the, the damage here is, is visible, it's evident. So our INSAR coherence data gave us a potential timing of some of that damage. It happened during, some of it at least, happened during our event period. We can further use the, the INSAR data to guide uh, optical image analysis. So let's look at another region where there was a greater than 15% decrease in coherence on, on the western edge of our image region. And we'll zoom in on the patch similarly using uh, Google Earth Pro optical imagery. And we'll see damage that, that occurred um, between April 5th and April 24th in this case. Um, there was a destroyed structure at this part and a, a collapsed roof, and probably some other damage that I don't notice, but this is just to illustrate that decreases in coherence can guide optical image analysis. Uh, similarly, in this time frame, uh, just before the end of our event period, there was an um, attack on a school and a, a hospital in Aleppo. An MSF hospital was bombed on April 28th, uh, 2016. And uh, the right is a, a tweet a, or a statement from MSF um, about the bombing of the hospital. And, and uh, the images below are from a, a report that MSF re released um, on the bombing of the hospital, Al-Quds Hospital. Um, so the left panel indicates the location of the hospital. And the right panel with uh, figure 29 beneath it is a satellite image from April 25th of that hospital. You can see it's quite small. Um, there's no scale here, but I'll have to scale on my back. Um, and it, that, that hospital is only going to um, occupy a, a portion of a pixel because our pixels are relatively large compared to that footprint. So here's what that area looks like on our map. It's, it's a small coherence anomaly. It's less than 10%. Um, and this is likely due to the fact that the hospital only occupied part of an imaging region, part of a pixel, and because it didn't completely collapse. So looking more closely at our imagery, um, we can only see a very small change in coherence there, if any. Um, I've, I've masked out, as you know, image, uh, regions that have coherence greater than or equal to zero. Um, and again, the hospital that was struck uh, was small and, and didn't completely collapse. So when we look at high resolution optical imagery that are similarly available in Google Earth Pro, um, we see an acquisition on April 16th. And there was a school um, that you can see partially collapsed across the street um, in imagery acquired uh, July 25th. But we know from humanitarian reports that these strikes occurred on uh, in, our, in our event period in April, late April. Um, but this collapsed building is the area of greatest coherence decrease that we've detected in the example today. Um, con uh, compare that to the hospital, al Quds Hospital. There's only a slight, if any, coherence decrease. And that's likely because the hospital only covers a portion of the pixel and it didn't completely collapse. So it didn't cause 
a significant enough rearrangement of the radar scatterers for us to see a big enough change. <clears throat> so that is the end of the tutorial walkthrough and interpretation of the results. And what I tried to show is that there are regions where we can attribute loss of coherence to the destruction of structures um, that we highlighted in the first two examples. And there's also things that we don't see that are beyond, um, to quote Al Weissman, uh, beyond our threshold of detectability. Um, so I hope that illustrates the strengths and limitations, some of our sensitivities, enough to get you started. And to get really into this method, my suggestion is to really start from the basics. And there is a vast amount of freely available materials, including past RSET trainings, um, to familiarize yourself uh, more with these methods. And I also suggest looking into the uh, other applica INSAR applications training, namely from Eric Fielding on landslide observations. Um, from there, as you begin to, as you solidify your more conceptual understanding of coherence, I build the conceptual understanding of coherence and, and how different dynamics at the surface can lead to uh, changes or, or low coherence. So I talked about dielectric changes from snow melts. Um, this can also happen from rain on dry soil or structural changes like the tilling of agricultural fields, construction or destruction. And in mapping of urban conflict damage, it's important to identify key dates or large scale conflict damage events that you want to detect. And it's important to have a very clear idea of what you're looking for before you start looking for it. So if it's a time period and a location, that's extremely important. ASF vertex tools and cloud-based INSAR processing have drastically reduce the barrier to entry to working with these data. So in my fourth suggestion, I strongly uh, recommend taking advantage and learning the ins and outs of these new cloud-based INSAR processing tools, uh, namely ASF Vertex, so that you can begin working with these data and learning the ins and outs of them um, and hopefully integrating them and in your humanitarian um, applications. And finally, it's so important to scrutinize output data with any and all available data for comparison. So today we use freely available high resolution optical imagery uh, from Google Earth, but if you're a humanitarian worker and there are people on the ground who can verify or there you have access to any other types of ancillary data for corroboration, that is extremely important before drawing any conclusions from these types of data. Um, finally, we've done the exact same example through a Python Jupyter notebook, uh, like I mentioned before, and that's freely available um, at the link above. Uh, it's also cited, and, and we work through the exact same the exact same example, but uh, in Python code and using the ASF for text API. So if you're in a position where you are comfortable in GIS and just want to get your feet wet in Python um, for GIS, this might be a great opportunity to go from a graphical user interface to uh, something like a Jupyter notebook. So that code is available um, for you. From there, uh, we'll ask if you have any questions to please enter them in the Q&A box. We'll answer them in the order they were received and we'll post the Q&A following this uh, this training on the website uh, after the conclusion of the work. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, here's our contact info. Uh, there's the link back to the webpage. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions or inquiries around running this kind of analysis. We have a, a good list of citations here. Please check these out. And thanks so much. Hope we can see you in two days at part two of the training, which focuses on mapping refugee settlement growth and population change.
Great, wonderful. Thank you to everybody that have been submitting questions thus far. We got some really great ones. Uh, why don't we just jump right into it? So question number one, how would muddy water appear in SAR? Can we distinguish it from clear water? And feel free to unmute and, and speak up, whoever answered that. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, so this is Corey. Thanks for the question. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. Great. Thanks, John. Um, so basically, SAR is only going to be sensitive to how rough the surface of the water is. So you can imagine uh, wind passing, rough, uh, strong wind passing over a water surface. That's going to change the scattering characteristics at the surface. But the SAR generally isn't going to be sensitive to um, suspended sediment, unless there's some relationship between suspended sediment and the roughness of the water surface, like if a river turned into a debris flow. Um, but generally, no, uh, you won't be able to distinguish clear from muddy water in a SAR image. Great, and thanks. Please go ahead. I can chime in. Um, uh, that would you we can of course do this with optical data to some extent assuming the particulate matter has remained near the surface um, we should be able to detect some change in spectral reflectance usually with the, the red band or the near infrared band um, and there are several metrics that have been produced um, the tss the total suspended solids or the common uh, spm suspended particulate matter those those kind of metrics should be sensitive in this scenario where SAR really doesn't tell us much, because as Corey said, this is all happening below the surface of the water. Question two, are SAR damage assessments possible when there's no prior SAR data to compare to for change? I can give a quick response to this one. This is Jamin. Um, unfortunately, no, we do need that precedent. We do need that, that reference period. Um, we need the pre if we're going to be able to detect the post. If we came at a potential uh, damage site and looked at it with SAR, we would just see a characterization of scattering that we wouldn't have a reference point to compare to. So it's important to remember that um, many things, you know, not everything scatters all the time, but we're always going to be able, in a city, for example, we're going to see this sort of scattering profile basically at any time we take an image over it. Um, and that it's that change, that deviation that Corey worked through in the case study that we're interested in. So we always need that, that previous comparison. I suppose there could be some, um, some fancy approaches to use optical data to extend their observational record prior to, for example, the launch of Sentinel-1 um, to go back to 2012, 2013, and use optical data to make a like a, a pseudo, like a texture map. Um, I bet there's some cool research in that direction, but, um, but that would be, that's sort of a, a different and much more complicated assessment. Um, but the short answer is we need to know the prior if we're going to understand uh, what happened in, the, in terms of the process or if the state that we see at the outcome, the post, if that's meaningful for damage or not. Thank you, Jamin. Uh, question three, is it possible to adapt the Python code to Colab, especially HyP3 and ASF search? Hey, this is Corey, so I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, you can actually open any Jupyter notebook in Google Colab by prepending um, this domain that I've uh, typed out in the answer. And I linked to an example um, of doing that. Uh, I don't know if anyone can click that link, but generally if there's a Jupyter notebook, thank, thank you uh, whoever is hosting their screen right now. Um, you can prepend this domain and then you can see our notebook um, there in Google Colab. And if you scroll down, um, to an interactive map, there should be a folium printed a little bit further down. Um, you don't even have to, sorry, keep going. Yeah, there you go, I can see it. You don't even have to run the code to be able to like move this map around, you can zoom in and out. Yeah, so it's already there for you to see. Uh, so you just prepend the Google Colab, colab.research.google.com slash GitHub to the location of the notebook, and then you can view it in Colab. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks so much, Corey. Uh, question four, 
When generating coherence copole or cross-pole channel, which should be considered? Which polarization channel should be used for coherence and interfer interferogram uh, generation, copole or cross-pole? Is that VV or VH? Yeah, so thanks for this question. Generally, we'll use, oh, sorry, this is Corey again. Um, we'll use the copolarized VV channel for Sentinel-1. And in fact, the ASF vertex tool doesn't give us an option um, because it's so common to use the copolarized channel. Um, I would refer back to the prior trainings on INSAR uh, for more detail on that, but we generally use the copolarized channel. And there's not even an option to choose the cross pole channel on ASF vertex. Thank you, Corey. Question five. If the settlement of urban areas is well structured, SAR image can identify the damages after any war or disaster from scattering change of the damaged building. What about if the settlement of the urban area is not well structured, like some of the area, like old Dhaka, uh, of the Dhaka city of Bangladesh? Will it affect the change range or differences of SAR image of the damaged area? Yeah, so thanks for this question. And in the INSAR community, there's generally um, trouble detecting changes over regions that aren't what we call persistent scatterers. Um, so the lower your the coherence, the pre-event or baseline coherence of your image region is, um, the harder it is or the less reliable it will be to detect change. So unfortunately, in less built up urban areas that act as reliable or persistent scatterers, we, we have more trouble um, detecting change relative to areas uh, really built up urban areas. Um, so this is a challenge for the for the method. Um, yeah. Thanks, Corey. Question six. In the case of Mariupol in Ukraine, it is said to be completely destroyed. Have you done some evaluation of how much decorrelation has appeared? Does it confirm heavy destruction? Um, so, in fact, yes, um, we, we have done these analysis and there's broad decorrelation across Mariupol um, throughout the um, conflict duration in Ukraine. I, I guess something to note would be that in the early part of the Russian incursion, um, there was snow, snow fall and snow melt occurring, so that limited our ability to retrieve um, damage proxies, but we, we've run the analysis um, later since the snow has disappeared. And yes, um, there is decorrelation there and we'll be following up with uh, more formal um, work, work on that in the, in the near, not so distant future. Um, I don't know, Jamin, if you want to say anything about that. Otherwise, we can just continue on to the next question. Yeah, Jamin might be muted, but um, Jamin, okay. If not, I will continue. Uh, question number seven, what are examples that show how a humanitarian actor has used SAR-based damaged assessment? What humanitarian actions have been based on such SAR analyses? I can so, take that. That's... Oh, sorry, thank... Corey. No, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, um, this is a, a good question. I think um, it's really early days for using SAR for a humanitarian application like this. Um, typically, the way it has been done uh, is by uh, international NGOs, humanitarian NGOs, and groups like uh, the United Nations, um, the UNEP, or uh, UNOCHA, or uh, UNOSAT, these kinds of groups. Um, might be interested in using uh, radar data in a similar way that we did today, a post-conflict uh, or post-disaster assessment. So this is really the norm um, so far. We're not really at a stage of seeing a, a kind of near real-time analysis. Um, even with the recent um, invasion of Ukraine, when there has been lots of large-scale urban damage, there wasn't a public facing at least, uh, illustration of using SAR in a sort of monitoring capacity. So unfortunately, we often end up um, re responding or 
uh, coming at these assessments uh, with with some delay. Um, I think that's changing because one of the things that's really um, shifting is the availability of higher resolution SAR as well from commercial providers. Um, that is a potentially uh, you know revolutionary um, opportunity for for humanitarian applications, and we have never had anything like that that we could detect SAR at a you know one meter level. We've never had that kind of access, especially for the humanitarian sector. Um, so I, I think in the next you know uh, few years, that we aren't even talking about decades here, but in the next few years, if we see um, another kind of large scale conflict, or certainly in, in any sort of large scale disaster like a uh, earthquake, for example we're going to see SAR being used in a much more real-time capacity. But but right now, it's it's very similar to what we've shown here. We estimate, we detect specific locations of change. We do uh, estimates over long periods of time to detect the area of damage. Um, and then those maps are made. Those maps are, are shared. They're used for um, planning reconstruction. They're used for identifying potentially affected populations or damage to infrastructure. So there's a whole host of different kinds of decisions that could be made from it, but but from a remote sensing perspective, it's it's not too different from what we did today, except for perhaps a, a bit more broader scale, right? We wouldn't be just looking at specific uh, two-week interval. We'd be looking at um, perhaps a multi-year study. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Damon. Uh, question number eight, we will skip over because it was answered previously. Question number nine, could this technique be used in rural areas? So hi, this is Corey. I'll do that one. Um, if there are built up structures within the rural areas that act as coherent imaging regions that are then destroyed or damaged uh, enough to where the, the change in coherence is detectable, then yes, the method can be used in rural regions. But generally, it's only going to be, it's going to be most sensitive to the built up structures within a rural region. Uh, if, if there is something like a large crater in a barren field, one might be able to pick that up also. Uh, but generally, it's, the method is most applicable to um, regions that are highly coherent, so largely built up regions that uh, become less coherent during a conflict event period. Great, thanks, Corey. Question number 10, what is the margin of error? This is a great question, and there's a prior study from 2018 by Natsuaki um, and colleagues uh, that quantifies the sensitivity and uh, describes the limitations for damage detection of individual buildings uh, using an earthquake as an example. So I would point you to that publication for a more quantitative um, description of the sensitivity and limitations uh, for assessing damage to individual buildings after, after an event of destruction. Hey, thanks, Corey. Question number 11. <clears throat> Hi, I'm working with the Rohingya refugee camp. Can I detect changes before and after a cyclonic event as the structure is not concrete? Um, uh, Corey, again, I'll take that. So thanks for um, joining us today and your work at the, the refugee camp. Um, and I, I guess the answer is similar to the rural areas. Or generally, if there's stability or, or a lack of randomness, so high coherence in the image region before, in this case, a cyclone or a cyclonic event, um, and we see the change in coherence after the event, then the method could be sensitive. Um, I haven't looked specifically um, at this region, but the, the publication I mentioned above, Natsuaki uh, et al. 2018, also describe structures that have things like um, tarps as roof, as roofs, um, somewhat informal structures. Um, so I would, again, maybe point back to that publication for sensitivity of coherent change detection in um, less built up regions, so with less concrete and roads. 
Thank you, Corey. Question number 12. What is the level of accuracy of INSAR-based damage mapping with reference to the actual damage, for example, a school building? Another great question, and it's uh, similarly um, addressed in this Natsuaki publication, but I'll, I'll say that qualitatively, the degree of coherent change in coherence is related to the level of destruction. Important so a completely destroyed structure. Sorry. So a, a, a completely destroyed structure. Is someone else trying to speak right now, or am I? Publications, no list. Ah, okay, thank you. So if a structure is completely destroyed, um, the coherence decrease will be larger. If the structure is partially destroyed, it will, it will be a smaller magnitude of decreasing coherence. So generally, as the degree of damage increases from something like partial damage to full destruction, coherent change detection is going to be more sensitive to those changes. And this is yet an, another example of, of a question that's addressed in the 2018 paper by Natsuaki and, and colleagues. So again, I'll refer you up to, up to that um, paper. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Uh, question number 13, does INSAR detect small-scale damages? I can answer this one quick. Um, it, there's a bit of, and Corey, please chime in on this one too. Um, there's a bit of a trade-off here because the small scale, I, I, I'm not sure if the question is asking about spatial extent in terms of small scale or small scale in terms of the impact or the severity. Um, and maybe that's intentional because the answer involves both of those. So we, we need to have, um, certainly if you have a large area that's being affected, that helps with detection. Um, but also if you have a high severity of very, you know, if you have a small building um, that collapses all the way, that has a different kind of signal than a large, larger building that um, is only partially damaged, uh, but it's damaged throughout, for example. So there's a bit of a trade-off in terms of that magnitude, the severity uh, and the spatial extent. Um, and so our approach that we showed today has a 40 meter resolution with the, the INSAR processing approach. Um, that means that that damage would need to be large enough to register within that pixel um, or th that that uh, region, I should say. That means that it's a trade-off. You could have a large impact, high uh, magnitude change that introduces so much decorrelation into the region that um, that you can. Or it's so pronounced that it it, it registers. Um, as uh, across the entire region, or you could have a less um, overall severe event, but it's across the entire 40 meter region um, that would also uh, re potentially register. So there's a bit of a trade off there, but in our experience, we really weren't able to see any fine scale low severity changes, but we did in some cases see. Uh, what appeared to be large magnitude changes that took place over a small region within our 40 meter by 40 meter uh, study area. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Jamin. Uh, question 14. I noticed the calculation done by the ASF vertex goes to a queue. Is it possible to make the calculations without that service? I'll take this one. This is Corey. Um, so past RSET trainings on INSAR have used non-cloud-based tools. Um, so ASF Vertex is a cloud-based tool to do INSAR processing. And this generally involves um, a somewhat powerful laptop and some freely available um, processing tools, but also the ability to download up to 10 gigabytes of data um, and process it locally on your computer. So short answer is yes, it's possible to do it without the ASF service, but the ASF service um, drastically reduces the local computing pro uh, capacity necessary to generate and work with these data. So we've highlighted the Vertex tool because it's relatively new um, and 
it effectively reduces the, the amount of steps it takes for someone um, to generate INSAR imagery and then simply download them to uh, analyze them further. I hope that answers the question. Great. Uh, thank you, Corey. Question 15. Uh, can different species be mapped using SAR images with the ASF-based tools online? Um, this is Jamin. I assume this is referring to, to vegetation species, trees, or, or perhaps crop type uh, and not animal species. Um, if we're talking about vegetation, um, yes, SAR can help with this study. This is not necessarily a humanitarian application, but um, if a different, if a, a type of vegetation species, say a different kind of forest, um, has a different kind of backscattering profile, which is to say a different kind of surface characteristics, surface roughness, as well as internal canopy structure, if those differ substantially from another type of species, then SAR um, should have something helpful to say. Um, sort of the ultimate for mapping tree species is uh, LIDAR and hyperspectral together um, because it's partially a spectral story and it's partially a structural story, right? Tree, different tree species, different crops appear differently in their structure. They also appear differently at different times of year um, in terms of their spectral signature. So um, bringing in, I would recommend using a LIDAR data or hyperspec and hyperspectral if you, if you have those available to you those are the two that are really going to be helpful. Um, SAR is part of that, can help with that, but of course we have some of these restrictions um, like the, uh, the spatial resolution that's there and uh, that, that's built into SAR and uh, its insensitivity, right, to, to actual spectral characteristics. Um, so it, it, it can help, but it's probably best to use other approaches. Thank you, Jamin. And if the question is directed specific to, say, crops, uh, we have provided two links to two different RSET trainings that were held in the last year using both optical and SAR imagery for crop classification. So if that is of interest to the person posing the question, please do refer to them as a reference. Question 16, what is the reason for using only copole coherence for interferogram generation? So this is Corey again. Thanks. This is a great question. Um, so polarization refers to the outgoing, the transmitted and received signal. So a copolarized signal, um, whether it's transmitted in the vertical or horizontal polarization, um, is also received in that um, polarization so that it hasn't been scattered volumetrically um, like you would see in a cross-polarized band. Um, so generally, INSAR is processed using the copolarized band because volumetric scattering mechanisms are, are going to be different than something where you'd be looking for a change in structural arrangement at the surface. So we want a vertical transmit and a vertical receive or a horizontal transmit and horizontal receive to be most sensitive to structural changes at the surface. Um, I would again point back to things like the ASF product guide or the um, Severe SAR handbook uh, for more on why copolarization is used relative to cross-pull for entire processing. Great, thanks, Corey. Question 17, is SAR applicable to drone imagery? Uh, this, uh, is this is Jamie. again. Oh, Jamin, you want to do oh, that? You, I think you might know more. <laughs> might know more about okay. this than I do. Yeah, basically, SAR is a is a just a remote sensing system. So you can you can have ground based SAR. You can have SAR mounted on a aircraft, uh, like the UAV SAR um, system from NASA, or or you can have it if the drone is big enough. That the systems are are somewhat heavy. Um, yes, it can be mounted on a drone. Um, so, yes, the short answer is yes, it's not specific to satellite. But it's very rare as well. It's very rare and very costly. Yeah. Great. Question 18. 
Is there any real-time SAR data source really available? Yes. Um, well, near real time, at least. And we've highlighted today using Sentinel-1 uh, SAR uh, in today's example. And the, the delay from uh, acquisition of an image to initial processing and uh, open source, freely available download, I think is only about a few hours. Um, so yes, the Sentinel-1 constellation is freely available near real time uh, SAR data. Great, and I'll point out that uh, uh, in the coming year, there'll be a new uh, joint mission between the Indian Space Agency and NASA called uh, NISAR, and that will be launching hopefully within the next year, and that will be providing an L-band uh, SAR capability, and that will be freely available as well. So hopefully the community will be interested in that mission once it launches. Uh, question 19, what could be the challenges to run this type of analysis in mountainous regions such as the Andes? Uh, Corey, again here. So I will um, I'll say that the viewing geometry is going to be the most complicating factor because of the complexity of the topography. So you're going to get distortions that have to do with uh, the the layover, foreshortening, and you'll get things like shadow um, based on where your the SAR sensor is viewing relative to your target region. So I had a slide on the distortions and layover from viewing geometry um, in complex topography, but that's generally going to be the challenge in topographically complex regions are the um, geometric distortions from layover, foreshortening, and shadow. Great, thanks. Corey, question 20. Based on your knowledge, would it be possible to predict which structures could be damaged in an event of destruction by war? Uh, I'll, I'll field this one. Uh, that's a good question. It's a tough one to answer. I don't think SAR is gonna tell us anything about that that we wouldn't know in a much more confident way through other sources. Um, but I mean, the, the key things, right? If you think about some of the case studies that Corey and I looked at, even some of the potential ones, where did we look in the Syrian civil war in Aleppo to try to find confident examples of repeat damage? We looked at hospitals, we looked at clinics. We could also look at schools. Um, these are some of the places that we know to have been targeted. These are routinely targeted in large scale armed conflicts, uh, these kinds of facilities. Um, there is a, uh, of course, a function of things like territorial control and the type of conflict uh, that, that's uh, occurring. Um, and different scales of conflict as well um, have different kinds of, of targets that are uh, more common, for example. Um, so uh, there is some logic and some theory, I guess I'll say, to what kinds of structures are targeted, but um, SAR is not going to, and there's military strategy around that, right, from, from either side um, that who might be engaged in the conflict, but SAR is probably not going to tell us too much about that. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jamin. Question 21. Uh, can this be used in land use, land cover change detection in mined areas or forests? I'll answer that. Uh, this is Corey, and the general answer would be, well, with respect to mining, uh, yes, because if if slopes are being um, dug into or blasted away with dynamite and things are being dug up and rearranged, you would generally see a low coherence. So I, I know that there were some Mm, studies on inter coherence during the COVID-19 lockdowns uh, related to things like construction, but it would also be applicable to mining, where if there's a rearrangement of scatters within a region, it should be sensitive to, um, SAR coherence should be sensitive to uh, the activity on the ground. For forests, it's a little more complex because you'll you'll have lower coherence in the uh well well the region is forested so if you're having if if the region is being deforested 
then you might want to look for uh, other components of the signal, like simply uh, backscatter intensity changes um, over time, uh, or you know, rely on optical imagery to look for change detection in those regions. But yeah, oh look, uh, someone has linked to an RSET training on mapping and monitoring um, in forest forested regions. So kindly refer to to this training uh, for more information on, on that. I'd follow up to say that the, the forest cover change is a much more confident in hand application. The land mining is uh, is tricky. Um, the the mining areas, Corey mentioned, you need to have sub you need to have substantial um, uh, disturbance on the ground to be detected, um, and you'd also uh, probably have better results with high resolution optical imagery. Um, that are acquired before and after. This is a, a somewhat, um, uh, well, it's a nascent kind of application um, of mining detection, but it's definitely been done. Um, and hyperspectral also has something to say about that, um, as does an indication of soil moisture, because when you disturb the ground, you change uh, the hyperspectral, uh, the sensitivity of uh, reflectance in hyperspectral sensors, and you also change the soil moisture profile. You can change it. So. Um, many of these factors are brought together. And there's a, a researcher at uh, Edinburgh, Gary Watmore, who um, uh, actually I, I think is involved in this kind of work, um, landmine detection um, in, using uh, optical high-res imagery. Great, thank you, Corey and Jamin. Uh, question 22, uh, does the ASF Vertex tool provide the mapping of flood inundation areas. Hey, uh, I'll do this one. Oh, sorry, I was not muted. Um, there is at least a Python tool um, in, in the ASF Hype 3 toolkit that gives a mapping, a water map function. Um, but I'm not familiar if the graphical user interface uh, gives the option to generate a derived product like a water map from a SAR image. Um, I will say that generally um, SAR data is very sensitive to the presence of surface water occurrence, and there's a lot of uh, literature and training, maybe even within the RSAT hazard detection a tutorial from Eric Fielding on using different types of SAR signals to map uh, surface water occurrence. I hope that answers that question. Great, thank you. And we also added a link to a uh, previous RSET training that did focus on on flooding and inundation um, in non-urban areas. So uh, hopefully that will help as well. Question 23, can I use SAR for soil moisture quantification? Is 40 meter resolution enough for this kind of analysis? So I would uh, ask you to recall this slide on penetration depth into a vegetation vegetated canopy relative to the signal wavelength. And because Sentinel-1 is a C-band sensor, you're not always going to get SAR returns uh, from Sentinel-1 that make it to the ground. Um, or into the soil surface at all. But as Sean mentioned, with the upcoming NISAR mission, L-band um, is a longer wavelength and it should have more sensitivity to changes in things like soil moisture than Sentinel-1. That said, there are um, studies that apply Sentinel-1 to soil moisture changes, um, but in the future, we'll, with upcoming NASA missions uh, from, from NISAR and ISRO, um, we should be able to have uh, better data sources for mapping things like uh, soil moisture change. Great, thanks, Corey. Uh, question 24, can SAR detect crop health? Uh, this is Jamin. Um, uh, health, that's a good question. Um, it could detect maturation. It could detect green up and growth. Um, but health, we usually think about in terms of biomass accumulation or vegetative vigor, and biomass accumulation would be something like net primary productivity, 
uh, greenness or vegetative vigor would be something like normalized difference vegetation index and DVI. Those are usually what we think about when we talk about health. Um, SAR brings the structural component to that. So if a crop has uh, fully matured, for example, um, you could detect that change um, and you could detect differentials between different plots, uh, different different farm plots uh, with different quality uh, of or, or health of different um, crops if that health comes through as a structural uh, attribute, right? Um, so yes, definitely we can uh, track the uh, we can track the the gener the growth of a crop um, over time from the planting through the harvest stage, um, and that tells us something about the crop's maturation um, and then potentially the senescence. However, I would probably defer more to, uh, and I'm sure the the, the user uh, the the audience member who asked this question is aware of these things, but um, I would uh, probably lean heavily on spectral characteristics as well, um, since those are a little bit more mainstream in terms of actually characterizing biophysically meaningful indications of crop health or even things like yield. Um, that, that that would be where I would start. And I think we probably have an R set on <laughs> crop mapping that we could bring in there. Absolutely, yeah, thank you so much, Jamin. Uh, question 25, using INSAR coherence changes in built up area, is it possible to distinguish damages from changes in construction? And have you encountered false damage detection using this method where a high value was detected but no evidence of building changes on the ground, such as damages or construction? What could possibly be the interpretation of such a case? Okay, this is a good one. Uh, thank you for this question. And there was some work um, that I think I mentioned in a previous answer on mapping coherence uh, during a COVID shutdown in some major city in the world. I would, I would have to dig up the study. But yes, if an area is under active construction, you'll similarly have a low coherence value because the, the scatters within that region are being rearranged. Um, so the, the study I'm thinking of highlighted um, an increase in coherence that corresponded to the COVID lockdowns as construction halted and the structures within an imaging region were stable. So in that case, knowledge of the local context of the signal uh, that these um, scientists were looking for was imperative to interpret a change in coherence uh, that in this case was due to the construction of buildings. Now, there's a second part of the question. Have you encountered false damage detection using this method? Um, but no evidence of building damage uh, was available on the ground. So there's a couple of uh, ways I wanna preface an answer to this, which is that it's generally quite hard to validate um, building destruction uh, in an active conflict zone uh, for regions you can imagine. Um, it's hard to get to and survey. And if we're trying to compare to things like optical satellite imagery, those optical satellite images aren't always going to indicate to someone analyzing them visually that damage has occurred. And there was a slide in my presentation um, on the background where, uh, for example, the roof of the structure was intact, but the structure itself partially collapsed causing a rearrangement of scatters. So it becomes a challenge for um, validation when we are looking at uh, large decreases in coherence and how to attribute those changes in coherence to uh, observed damage um, in high resolution optical imagery, for example. Um, I hope that answers that question. I'll chime in there too as well. I, I think, thanks Corey. I think that it's a really good question because um, cities don't stop, people people don't stop living in cities during conflicts, right? There are, um, at the start of the civil war, we had about 3 million people in Aleppo. Um, and a couple of years in, we still had 600,000. So um, it's not as if activity and rebuilding, even if the rebuilding is temporary, it's not as if that stops, right? It's not a uniform process. So it's a really good question because this is a really tough thing to do well for all the reasons that Corey mentioned. 
I would just add that um, in uh, northern Aleppo, there is a, uh, a quarry and open mining area. And that area contributes lots of change. That area pops out um, in optical and radar damage assessments um, at different times of year. And one would be, of course, you know, quick to say, well, this is a consistent recurrent damage event, but it's not. It's um, it's mining, right? It, it's it's the it's the economy continuing is one way you could and livelihoods persisting despite the conflict. Um, so uh, similarly, when we have um, even more sort of nefarious, difficult to detect is um, just change uh, changes that are uh, continually occurring in the reorganization of tree canopies um, in city parks, including in Aleppo. There's there's change there happening all the time, and so it's difficult for us to say if that's meaningful damage or or even the destruction of that forest grove, for example, or if it's just sort of this. Uh, continual res reshuffling of, of the tree structure. Um, so what, what this question is getting at is um, attribution, confidence in attribution. And that's a really difficult thing to do uh, without um, different data sources that you can triangulate together uh, to say, this data source showed that we had high conflict intensity at this date, at this location. This other data source, let's say it's our SAR map, shows that we have acute decorrelation, decoherence during the same period. And this other data source is from people on the ground who pointed out that this certain building was attacked, or they recorded it with a WhatsApp uh, video recording. That's usually sort of the, the um, standard of evidence. We, we need quite a lot to be able to attribute specific thing, specific events um, to, sorry, specific damage uh, indications to specific events. Um, so it's a, it's an excellent question and um, the one that I think needs you know much much more investigation um, as we go forward and we kind of try to bring up INSAR to the level of other kind of uh, damage monitoring uh, tools or data sets. Thanks for asking that question. All right, thank you, Jamin and Corey. Uh, question 26: Could INSAR be used also to detect mass graves as well as tanks and troops? I can comment on this one. Um, it could be certainly um, reorganization of vehicles uh, between scenes could introduce a measurable change in, in decorrelation, decoherence. Um, troops, maybe not so much. Individual troops, maybe not so much, but tanks and trucks, uh, certainly. Um, that uh, just on that note, um, there's been a lot of work on that. In uh, we we did work on that. Um, seven years ago in Gaza, actually, detection of tanks, not with INSAR, but with high-res imagery. So I would still probably use high-res to look at something that's that fine of a scale, but it may come through in, in SAR as well. Um, on the question of mass graves, um, that's a good one. Um, there has been some work on that. Um, I haven't seen it yet with INSAR, but I have seen it with optical high-res data. Um, and that's another kind of that that's um, a similar line of questioning to the earlier questions about change in soil moisture or the mining uh, landmines. These are some of the same kinds of things. Um, these these are some of the same kinds of challenges between these topics. You know, soil disturbance, uh, reorganization of potentially minute uh, reorganization on the surface characteristics. Um, there there might be a couple of different ways we could go at that. SAR should offer something to that story. Um, but I would, if possible, I would probably defer to, to other data sources before getting into SAR. Uh, I'll, I would like to hop in there real quick. There, there was a one slide where I showed an intelligence application to map um, vehicle tank tracks. And that study used a very high resolution synthetic aperture radar um, on the order of uh, meters of uh, pixel resolution. So with the Sentinel constellation, uh, we, it's much coarser. So theoretically, yes, it's possible, but with the freely available and open source data sets, um, it's less possible. Thank you, Jamin and Corey. Looking at the time, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, so I think what we can do is for those for the questions that we were not able to answer within this two hours, we will uh, 
We will answer all of them in the in the coming week, and uh, we will post this to the training page. So again, for those that did a ask a question, uh, fret not, you you uh, it will be addressed, it will be answered. Uh, we just want to respect everybody's time, uh, considering this is a, a two hour webinar. I, I do want to thank everybody that joined today, wherever you're joining from. Uh, we hope you're staying safe. Uh, it's really great to hear back from people in the community as well. So we're really excited to have you join us today. Uh, before we wrap up, I did want to hand it over to both Jamin and Corey if they had any closing comments before before we end today's training. So uh, maybe Jamin, if you wanted to uh, go first. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining today, asking such great questions. It's wonderful to have um, this kind of engagement with this uh, kind of application. As you know, this is the first NASA application for or RSET training, rather, on humanitarian applications. Um, so we're really interested in hearing from you. We're really interested in hearing what you're working on, what you're interested in working on uh, with uh, INSAR, but also the rest of what we're uh, talking about over the next three trainings. Um, the next two parts, uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, vegetation changes, infrastructural changes, degradation monitoring in refugee settlement contexts, so sort of uh, post-displacement. Um, we'll be thinking about uh, how we can use different kinds of open source, uh, rather open access data to monitor short-term and long-term changes, including the rapid establishment of refugee settlements and then and some of the longer-term uh, ecological impacts thereof. Um, and then in our uh, fourth part to this training, we will be looking at climate exposure in refugee camps as well and developing a purely remote sensing based index for climate exposure, um, which will be uh, using a case study at uh, Cox's Bazaar in, in Bangladesh where uh, Rohingya refugee population, a large refugee population lives today. Um, and one of the earlier attendants said they were working on a uh, Rohingya um, study. So that, that's wonderful. I hope those are of interest to you as well. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out over email or um, different various social media platforms that you have available to you. And I hope, you, uh, hope we'll see you at the next uh, parts to our training. Thanks. Corey, did you have any last closing uh, thoughts or comments for the participants? Well, Thanks, Sean, and thanks, Jamin. I'll just echo Jamin and say uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And if you are working in a humanitarian field and want to integrate these specific methods of INSAR coherent change detection with your, your work um, for monitoring uh, damage from military conflict, um, reach out to us um, or, you know, for any reason, uh, please be in touch. And just thank you again for coming and for all the great questions. And thank you to the RSET team for hosting this and uh, for the opportunity to put this all together and present it to you. So. Thanks, everybody. Great, Corey, Jamin, uh, we appreciate it so much and for, for kicking off this four-part webinar series so well. I also want to acknowledge the RSET team uh, working tirelessly in the background. That's Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, Sarah Kutchall, uh, Jonathan O'Brien, and Amita Mehta. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, everybody, for joining. We look forward to seeing you in two days. Goodbye.